thank you so much, Bruce, for making time for us today. Welcome to the mm. session. Thank you. It's, it's a real pleasure. Thank you all very much. Uh, well, <laughs> actually, I've been told to do a grounding exercise, but it is a good idea. So what I'd like all of us to do is to start off by uh, putting the focus of your attention into your right foot. Um, I don't know what talks you've been listening to so far, but consciousness is um, a maddening thing to talk about because words just don't get there. So it can be very useful to sort of switch off one's mind for a little while. So sense into your right foot, wiggle the toes of your foot, see if you can arrive inside your foot so that you're not just visualizing it nor are you seeing it from up in your head you're seeing if it's possible to sense it from the inside you might be able to sense the heat and the weight and the shape of the foot so this is consciousness, you're simply knowing what your right foot is like in this moment. You are the knowing. You can't find this knowing, but you can be it simply by paying attention to what is directly and immediately in your experience. So just spend a moment in your foot Notice what it's like. How does that affect you to come into land in your foot as far as you can? If your mind's racing along, asking, oh, what's going on? What's he doing? That's all right. Notice that. So I want to say something about where I'm coming from as a preface to this talk. Because exploring consciousness is an intimate, personal journey of feeling into what is true for you through all the layers of me, all the way down to the truth. In the beginning, it can be very confusing because the me is estranged from the truth and lives in the total conviction that we are a separate being. We find ourselves already looking through the eyes of this separate me who longs to find the truth but cannot find it and does not know where to look. Only if the me melts down like a little boat made of ice can it know the ocean. I spent 20 years teaching children on a one-to-one -one basis who have been excluded from school, usually because they had done something violent like pulling a knife on a teacher. They all had thick files, some of them several files, including psychological assessments and usually a diagnosis from a range of authorities. The authorities included clinical psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, neurologists, head teachers and policemen. I was struck again and again that the authorities didn't really listen to the children I taught. They looked at them from the outside as if they were objects. They diagnosed them by identifying a clinical syndrome such as depression or ADHD or oppositional defiant disorder according to a sort of checklist of symptoms. They believed they had access to objective truths about the children which did not require them to listen to or to understand the children. Consequently, in the children's experience, they simply felt they had been judged, that they must be bad, and that no one had listened to them. Perhaps I should explain that I was at the bottom of the food chain. I had a large blue laundry bag full of Lego, and I went to teach children one at a time in their own homes because, well, they'd become a risk to other children and their teachers and most no one really knew what i did 
And because I was user friendly and I had no power to diagnose them or give them drugs or take the children away from their families, and because kids like making robots and cars and things, I liked it too, really. Uh, sometimes they'd end up talking to me. I mean, they talked to me in a different way from, you know, you can imagine they've been evaluated by a psychiatrist. So one of the children I worked with was eight years old and was excluded from school because he'd very nearly strangled a classmate. It took three women to pull him off. When I went to his home to teach him, I asked him, what sort of animal is your anger? And he said, instantly, it's a lion that kills its prey. The next week I said to him, how's your lion? And he said, the lion and me think differently. He goes, boo, and I go, eek. Um, Actually, I'm not sure how good your English is. Boo is a child's word for like trying to frighten someone. Boo! And eek means, oh, I'm scared. For those of you who know something about internal family systems theory may recognize a firefighter and an exile. This is always stuck in my head because in that moment he knew his own mind and he trusted his experience. In knowing and speaking for himself, he was able to speak step back into mindfulness and recognize the lion and understand that it was part of him who could be very angry but had a job to do to protect the boy in him who went eek. It was a breakthrough for him to disidentify from the lion and recognize the scared little boy in him it was trying to protect. This immediate direct knowing and trusting and being for himself was so different from what happened to most of the children I work with who were diagnosed by authorities who didn't listen to them, so that the children felt alienated and judged and labeled from the outside by someone who didn't know them. One of my favorite sayings from the Buddha is, you can't come to the end of suffering unless you come to the end of the world, but you can't come to the end of the world by traveling. What does this mean? I was flying somewhere and my pen suddenly leaked all over my shirt. It had never done this before and I was curious. Buddhists say we construct our experience of reality moment by moment as we contact an object of the senses through a sense organ while interpreting and shaping what we know through the lens of a perception. Perceptions in this case object objectified and reified my pen so I believed it was an object out there. And reified, a, reified is also possibly a word you may not be familiar with. It was used originally by Marxists, and it means to make something into a thing. You know, like, I don't know, treating a woman as an object, for example. So anyway, uh, my perceptions, uh, which I was totally... Uh, I don't know, I just took them for granted. I, I, I just thought it was my pen. Uh, I, I, I just thought it was there to, you know, write when I wanted it to. And I, I had no idea it existed independently of me, really. So seeing the ink leak all over my shirt allowed me to recognize my pen did not exist independently. Um, so I, I got mixed up there. So what I, what I meant is that I suppose I thought that the pen is just existing for my purposes it was going to do what I thought it was going to do. It surprised me that it suddenly leaked all this ink. And I had forgotten that it was subject, like everything, like you and me, to causes and conditions. We're all constantly subject to the changing nature of life, you know, like polluted air. It affects us when we breathe it in. In this case, because the atmospheric pressure on the plane was different, it behaved differently. It is astonishing how deeply humans construct perceptions of reality which they believe are real and exist independently. Take the perception England, for example, or you might want to think about the perception of India. You cannot find England anywhere. I have a passport which says I'm English, but you can't actually find England. It just doesn't exist. It's an idea. Nonetheless, people are deeply attached to their imagination of what it means and are willing to die for these abstractions. So ignorance in Buddhism means believing something exists separately. In order to penetrate our ignorance, 
we need to recognize the preconceived assumptions we have, which prevent us from seeing clearly. Philosophers like David Chalmers have dubbed consciousness the hard problem. Actually, once you drop all the preconceived assumptions about what it is, it is obvious and simplicity itself. But you have to drop the deepest and often the most unconscious assumptions, the most important of which is the belief in me as a separate entity and the world is out there. Western science focuses on measuring the world we experience through our senses, even when it uses instruments such as microscopes and telescopes, it never gets outside of our senses. Scientists have been so wary of the biases, opinions and preconceived assumptions that the subjective is associated with that they have forgotten their own knowing. They have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Yet scientists plan their experiments in their minds <coughs> and know the data they produce with their own subjective knowing. Consequently, the conventional Western paradigm of consciousness tries to explain it in terms of biochemical processes. A paradigm is a set of assumptions, a set of crystallized perceptions with which our own knowing can be so fused we quite forget we are already looking through a point of view based on arbitrary assumptions. Because we have split off the subjective and only value the objective world, it appears devoid of being and meaning. We have enshrined the rational mind as the sole guide to what is true without beginning to understand its drastic limitations. It is not an accident that all the Western societies have been greatly enriched through the use of technology. The level of distress and unhappiness in our societies has soared as a reflection of our alienation. Anil Seth, the professor of neuroscience at the University of Sussex, where I went so many years ago, describes in his new book, Being You, that scientists used to believe in principles like phlogiston, which was believed to be at the root of anything that burned, which gradually yielded to biological and chemical explanations. Consequently, he put aside any idea of explaining consciousness outside of biochemical reactions and from what I would say is an arbitrary standpoint, claims that consciousness is just a sophisticated way of predicting what's going to happen next. It is true that it is profoundly challenging to take our own knowing seriously, to dare to explore the immediacy of your consciousness outside of the paradigm of Western science. If you just take a moment and say your name to yourself, I'm going, I'm going to say Bruce, Bruce. And ask yourself, who is saying my name? Can you find who is saying your name? The awareness appears to jump back before our attempt to objectify it. Who or what is knowing your name? The second you try to grab this knowing, it vanishes. It cannot be objectified. In the Bible, actually, I think it is originally an ancient Indian story. There is a parable of five blind men who are asked what an elephant is. One gets hold of its tail and says it's like a rope. Another gets hold of its ear, says it's like a leaf. Another gets hold of its leg and says it's like a pillar and so on we end up with a series of attempts at grasping what the elephant is from the outside, but only succeed in reifying and objectifying parts of the animal. But what is the whole elephant? My experience of the social sciences and psychology is that in the absence of a theory of mind, in the absence of recognizing and understanding how crucial consciousness is, in the absence of an understanding of the whole elephant, they take up arbitrary standpoints which grasp at consciousness from the outside. R.D. Lang, who was, a, who was a, a wonderful and deeply controversial psychiatrist, wrote a book called The Divided Self, which says, even the same thing seen from different points of view gives rise to two entirely different descriptions and the descriptions give rise to two entirely different theories Theories which result in two entirely different sorts of actions. 
Carlo Rovelli, who was an Italian quantum physicist, writes that the long search for the, quote, ultimate substance, end quote, in physics, has been shipwrecked on the relational complexity of quantum theory, and he has turned to Nagarjuna, who was an ancient Indian Buddhist thinker, in the hope that he might be able to provide the conceptual tools modern physics needs. So many religious traditions have known for a long time that the truth of being cannot be objectified, can only be approached on the inside by diving into the direct immediacy of knowing. So how can we explore consciousness in a way that honors our own knowing? As a baby, we have what can perhaps be said to be an original innocence. And since consciousness partly operates as a camera and as a tape recorder, we record impressions of who we are and what the world is. These impressions are structured around the belief that we exist as a separate entity formed in response to our parents. Consequently, as we come to adulthood, we find ourselves locked inside a whole mass of mental representations with which we are deeply identified. These pictures of me are alienated from a direct immediacy of knowing. From here, it's easy to imagine consciousness as just a function of the brain and fail to explore it directly or take it seriously. Another way of putting this is that we learn to define, signify, and regard ourselves from the outside through the lens of our mental representations. For example, I am a white English elderly psychotherapist, and I have learned to see myself through these concepts. I shall call this conventional way of thinking, um, which I'm sure you've all been educated in, um, I'm going to call it conventional knowing. It's the normal intellectual knowing, which has many assumptions built in. Um, I'm going to call it conventional knowing after A.H. Almaz. So many Indian gurus, such as Nisargadatta and Ramana Maharshi, were very clear about what it takes to die to all the stories in one's mind about who one is and dive deep into the truth beyond the mind. Following Almaz, I shall call this basic knowing. This is simply being the direct and immediate knowing stripped as far as possible of all assumptions. When you sensed into your foot at the beginning of this talk, I was wanting to foster and encourage you simply to receive whatever sensations you had on your foot. Hopefully you're not thinking about it and thinking, oh, this is that muscle and this is that tendon. And I read this something or other in a medical textbook. That would be a conventional knowing. This immediate, direct, palpable knowing is can be very, very different. It's actually it's actually very challenging, I think, to really understand, to let go of the assumptions deeply enough to get a glimpse of this completely different way of seeing life. So I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to allow myself to tell you a little bit about some of my experiences because you may be, it may inspire you, it may encourage you, it may appall you. Um, given that we are experiencing a psychedelic renaissance, it is worth stating that 50 years ago, I took some LSD. I think I'm gonna say now, it, it is a very volatile drug. I, I, it's, it's very illegal. I am not recommending its use without great caution. Still, perhaps I was lucky. I remember blinking and swallowing and suddenly finding that I was no longer the separate entity I had taken myself to be, but inside the entire universe. Aldous Huxley called this mind at large. I could see everything was the one mind. And yet at the same time, it was obvious that people were at cross purposes of themselves. You could see their eyes and their smile didn't link up that they were struggling, that they were fixated on the idea of being a separate entity and from that place unable to flow with life as it is. Hubert Benoit, who was uh, a French, is originally a French surgeon and a violinist, and then he was caught up in the Allied bombing of the V1 bunkers in the Second World War, and his right arm became smashed. He could no longer operate. He could no longer play the violin. 
he had quite a profound awakening and became a psychiatrist. He says, we are already here and now awakened. The, tr the truth isn't really very, it isn't far away at all. But this truth is hidden from us because our normal habits and reactions are constantly at work and they set up a vicious circle within us. Our rumination and inner monologue prevent us from awakening to our Buddha nature. We therefore believe we lack essential reality, and so we are obliged to imagine in order to compensate for this illusory defect. I believe I am separated from my own being, and I look for it to reunite myself with it. Only knowing myself as a distinct separate individual, I look for the absolute as a distinct individual, and I want to affirm myself absolutely as a distinct being, as being unique. This effort creates and maintains in me at the level of phenomena, my divine fiction, my fundamental claim that I am omnipotent as an, indi as an individual. He actually says this claim to be omnipotent is the key to suffering. That the roots of pride and self-esteem go down very deep and we tend to um, want the world to be um, to do what we want it to do and that all our negative feelings are the result of humiliations is really worth um, reading if you're interested in the subject anyway um after after my lsd experience i i discovered zen it seemed to describe the truth i had experienced Perhaps I should, in fact, my first Zen teacher said my LSD experience was my greatest obstacle, but I'm not so sure. It, gave, it did give me a lot of faith. I did many Zen retreats. I became locked into an all-consuming doubt about who I really am. And after years of, you know, really quite intense struggle, I, I came to an awakening on retreat 10, 10 feet away from a famous Chinese monk, Master Shen Yen. It felt like I fell a really long way and I was everything and nothing. These are classic Zen phrases, but unless you've had the experience, it's probably meaningless. Everything was arising and passing away, out of and back into a silently shining mystery. Somehow it's obvious that the mystery is beyond birth and death. The first words out of my mouth were, I can see. I, I said this to Master Sheng Yen, actually. He said, see what? <laughs> they test you out. I said, my heart is open. Perhaps it's worth carrying on with this. I, I had to go and see him in an interview. And he said that I wanted this experience affirmed as Ken Show's enlightenment. He'd have to get an interpreter. And I said, I don't want you to put a label on this experience. And I don't want to put a label on it either. And I'm so glad I said that because this truth comes without any labels whatsoever. It isn't Hindu, it isn't Christian, it isn't Buddhist. It may be, I, I'm not a scholar, it may be that uh, um, there are subtle differences in the, in the ways in which people talk about these experiences, but at least from my point of view, I can see a great deal of common ground between Ramana Maharshi and Meister Eckhart. And dare I say it, what happened to me? I mean, they're infinitely greater than I am, but still. So the person who began the meditation tradition um, that I studied with was a Chinese monk called Rinzai. He says, followers of the way, mind is without form and pervades the 10 directions. In the eye, it is called seeing. In the ear, it is called hearing. In the nose, it smells odors. In the mouth, it holds converse. In the hands, it grasps and seizes. In the feet, it runs and carries. Fundamentally, it is one pure radiance. Divided, it becomes a harmoniously united spheres of the senses. So in some ways, it's very simple. Who is talking to you now? Who is listening right now? before we apply all these mental filters. 
So I, I, I'm not, uh, <laughs> as it must be obvious, I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, I am, but I am not in any way wanting to uh, ignore neurochemistry. But I am saying that there is a mystery um, which the brain is a conduit for. It isn't just about neurotransmitters and serotonin. MDMA, for example, which again, I'm not condoning its use since it's highly illegal, but it's, it's legal now in Israel, will become legal before very long in, in America and England, because it's, it's helpful. Um, it may well release serotonin and it may well soften up the default mode network, but at the same time, it allows the mind, this natural mind, this mystery of consciousness, to expand and know itself on a deeper level. So now we're going to do a brief exercise, one of the purposes of which is to begin to distinguish this basic knowing from conventional knowing. Almaz writes that we need to become comfortable with not knowing. We have to embrace not knowing, not as a deficiency or a lack, but as the manifestation of basic knowingness. Like someone asked you right now, what is consciousness? Well, in fact, many Zen teachers have often described it as don't know mind. It's quite, it's, it's, it's really good to allow yourself, if you can recognize there's something you know, you don't know, this gives you a lever rather than just clinging on to what other people have thought, or maybe what you read in a university textbook, you can begin to inquire for yourself and begin to trust your own knowing. Maybe the first step is to recognize you don't know. So he, he says not knowing is itself knowing. You know you don't know. And it's actually quite a pure experience of knowing and it, it feels unfettered. It's not trapped in preconceived ideas. Otherwise, he says, what we experience will be the repetition of the same things we've known in the past and believe we know. The thoughts we have in our mind often contain all kinds of assumptions which are unprovable or arbitrary. More importantly, we believe we are separate from the situation we're in. However, if we sense into our bodies, not think about them, but directly know them, we can begin to taste mindfulness or basic knowing. It is like putting your foot in the bath to check the temperature. Thinking about it will not help. Directly knowing and being fully in touch with the flow of sensations will. To the extent we can do this without what the Heart Sutra calls thought coverings, we can begin to trust the knowing. So I invite you to come back to your right foot again. <coughs> it might help you to land in your right foot, wiggle the toes the right foot maybe to press it on the ground. And just to begin present to whatever sensations you find there. See if you can simply notice whatever sensations you find in your right foot. See if you can notice if you, at the very beginning of this talk, the temperature and the weight of the foot and the shape of the foot. See if you can sense into your right big toe. Now include the right ankle. You're not deserting the foot, you're simply moving with consciousness along, sensing from the inside what it's like to be in your leg. And include the right calf and the right knee. See what sensations are there. It's so easy for the mind to glide over things and think it knows something and lose this immediacy of knowing. And then begin to include the right thigh and feel the weight of the right thigh and the shape of it. Include the right buttock. 
and move your attention into the palm of your right hand. Notice how your right hand feels. You might feel tingly. You might notice the temperature. You might notice its weight. Just simply being with the sensations of your hand in this moment. Include your right wrist and your right forearm and your right elbow and your right upper arm. And move across to the top of the left arm. See if you can be curious. What's it like to be in your left upper arm in this moment? See if you can feel its weight. See if you can feel your left elbow and your left forearm and the left wrist and the left hand. Move your attention to the left buttock sensing into the buttock and you begin to include the left thigh again noticing the temperature the weight include the left knee and sense into the left calf and the left ankle and the left foot See if you can notice the sole of the left foot, your big toe on your left foot. And see if you can simply notice the whole body sitting here. We usually have some awareness of the torso, which is why I've only um, encouraged you to sense into the arms and legs. See if you can simply sit here as a body it isn't really your body, it's on loan to you. It's like a library book it gets checked out. One day you'll have to give it back to nature. See if you can simply hear with the whole body, allow whatever sounds there are to come to you. Don't go out after them. See if you can relax any judgment, whether you like this sound, hate that sound. Just allow yourself to listen to whatever sounds of the world there are. And now open up to all your physical sensations. Feel the feeling of your clothes, the pressure of your chair, any physical tensions or discomforts in your body. Include the thoughts and feelings that are here. See if you can just rest in this field of everything you are experiencing, allowing yourself to open up to the way it is. And ask yourself, what is experiencing all this? Don't try to answer the question. Just pose the question, what is experiencing all this? Just pose the question and see what happens. So this is the traditional way of aligning with our own immediate knowing of developing mindfulness, of learning to contemplate all our experience as changing conditions in nature that arise and pass away. Kava, um, as was said, Gazala, if I pronounce her name right, I, don't, I suspect I don't, never mind. Yeah. I do, that's good. My first Zen teacher was very unusual in that she emphasized that the passions are the Buddha nature. She did not emphasize teaching mindfulness because mindfulness can be very easily contaminated by the mind and turned into a mental activity, which actually gets in the way of the depth of surrender and simplicity required for your spiritual eye to open. She emphasized facing the waves of our passions directly, suffering them out and allowing them to take us down into our ocean nature. 
When I was a, a novice Zen monk in Japan, I had a dream of a ghost and an elephant. The elephant was under a concrete arch and covered in mud, but it had a golden Buddha in its trunk. I was looking at it through the eyes of a ghost and afraid of the power of the elephant. This dream was a gift, a very difficult gift, a snapshot of how the infant me had split himself and turned to the outside and taken my strength prisoner. But I think, it's, I think it happens to all of us in some degree that we turn to the outside, we turn to what seems like the objective world out there, our attention goes there, we believe that's where the goodies are, and we split ourselves. And then when we split ourselves, um, you can't see clearly. They used to sell cameras which had a split lens. You had to turn the, you had to turn the focus until the two sides came together. And um, <laughs> it's been a little bit like that for me. It's been very difficult to get the two sides to come together. Well, actually, I don't think it really was very difficult. It's just uh, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of humbling. Life humbles us if we allow it to humble us. So eventually I discovered the teachings of Almaz. The very first words he ever said to my group were, this is not an integration of the psychological and the spiritual, but a recognition they come from the same place. It was very helpful to me that Almaz is so clear to anger, which I had mistaken the power of the elephant for, is fundamentally the strength of true nature or the Buddha. Obviously anger can do terrible things, People stick knives in each other. People are often very frightened of anger because it can be very strong and volatile. Nonetheless, if, and I accept it's not an easy thing to do since I've struggled with this myself a lot, if we breathe into the anger and we feel it as the heat and the power and we begin to release the stories that are connected to it, the stories might be blame, like you bastard, you did this to me, whatever it is. It takes uh, humility, I suppose, to open up and feel the heat and the power of the anger. If we do this, if we have the courage to do this, it gives us the strength to separate from being the child of our parents. As Alma says, it's like going from one star system to another star system to separate from our mother and to stand on our own two feet. We forget as adults how deeply we loved our mother, that we lived inside of them for around nine months. Maybe we sucked on their breasts and it's supposed to be one of the most intense relationships we ever have. So it's quite a big deal to really um, let go of one's mother. And so doing, we can, we can at least taste the possibility of separating from the identifications we've taken ourselves to be and find ourselves able to see through the eyes of the Buddha. Uh, Almaz, as he calls himself, has published about 19 books and has evolved a form of inquiry, which is about knowing and discriminating the truth of our experience. Um, I'm talking about this partly because this is been a path I've been on, but it's also true that um, it's. Uh, I have great respect for Nisargadatta. I hope you know who he is. He has this famous book called I Am That. Um, but I have great respect for Ramana Maharshi too, but it's probably fair to say that not many people are able to emulate their devotion, their courage, their willingness to jump into the abyss. So Almas is a bit more like painting by numbers. Um, well, I don't want to exaggerate its utility. It's still challenging. It still takes a lot of perseverance and courage and sincerity. But still, he has evolved a way of knowing and discriminating the truth of our experience. It often involves tuning into the felt sense of the body. As we know the felt sense of the body immediately and directly, it can be a doorway into deeper qualities of the heart, the will, and the mind. This inquiry can allow us to recognize and discriminate different implicit qualities of true nature. So the experience I described earlier on of being everything and nothing, um, it's almost impossible to say anything about what you 
see, but Buddhists call it emptiness. But it's like, in a way, it's like the, it's like white light, really. You can actually pass white light through a prism, and there are many, many different qualities of light. It's the same thing of true nature. At least it is for Almas that it's possible to refract true nature. In fact, it gets refracted anyway through us as a human. And it's possible to tune into these refractions. So, uh, for example, I have a cat who's snoozing right now on the other side of my computer. And he can lie around in the most nonchalant fashion with all four legs in the air, which to my somewhat harassed mind is utterly disarming. I find myself feeling this tender appreciation in my heart. If I sense into this directly, so this is what Almaz means about being the knowing. It's possible to sense into the sweet tenderness and to be the sweet tenderness. It's very, very, very different from that objectifying knowing that we experience through conventional knowing in our head. And although I think probably many people, intellectual scientists would tend to discard this kind of knowledge, thinking of it as hopelessly subjective, it's actually not true. It's possible to sense into different kinds of love. Um, you can see that different people can tune into these same qualities. They actually have um, a certain sort of taste and they even have different colors. So anyway, so it, it's, th this is one of the easier qualities to experience. Uh, I kind of, um, Almaz calls it the pink. It's a certain quality of love. So very often we miss out on these qualities because we treat consciousness as just a function of the brain and then we fail to open up to the consciousness itself. Uh, some years ago, I watched England play Sweden um, in the World Cup of football. Uh, we scored, I, actually, I was gonna, I think I'm gonna say, I actually, I don't really like football. I, I just found myself watching this thing but nonetheless, I suppose it was, a, it was an important match. We scored a goal, the, the crowd erupted with joy. And I found myself, even though I didn't like football, feeling this huge sense of expansion. And this, this sense of expansion and unification, obviously the crowd attributes this to the label England is winning. It pulled the whole nation out of a sense of kind of uh, dragging ourselves on and feeling life lacked joy. So Durkheim, Emile Durkheim, who was a great French sociologist a long time ago, um, believed that the what he called the collective effervescence of crowds was responsible for the phenomenon of religion. You can see that if you begin to understand consciousness, we can actually turn this, comp this observation on its head and see that we get a, a glimpse of the unity of consciousness in feeling the power of the crowd, but we misinterpret it because we see it through the lens of our identification with our nationality. You can see how easily patriotism becomes a mask for a collective narcissism. Society is also a set of assumptions that we often uncritically identify with. So narcissism in this case means conflating our own entitled hopes and fears with the unconscious unity of the whole then we see through the lens of an inflated me. There's a sense of perhaps being special. It can actually be, I'm specially good, I'm specially right. It can actually even be, I'm specially bad. There can be negative inflation too. There is a medical student's joke, I'm not saying this to be funny, but because it's extraordinarily accurate, that neurotics build castles in the air, psychotics live in them, and the psychiatrist collects the rent. In fact, I think this is the normal human condition, quite frankly, that the ego is always running away from something and running after something else. And we don't get to be here and see calmly and impartially what's going on. And the castle in the air functions as a kind of airbag that we identify with, which keeps us separate and una unable to be fully with reality as it is. So this inflated me is actually very fragile because it isn't real. 
and is desperately trying to imitate our real self and is terrified of being exposed. Uh, hence, it's often accompanied, perhaps always accompanied to some degree, by an idealizing transference. I, I've spent quite a lot of time in America and um, Americans were very good to me and I have been sorely tried by watching what's happened in America the last few years where I, someone, uh, there's a New York comedian that said that Trump is the poor man's idea of the American success. And I think many people lean on him and believe he has the key to something because they idealize him. So it, it's, it's, I just think this is the natural condition of humans. We, we don't realize just how uh, irrational we are. We, we, we actually project the quality of will. This is where Hamid is brilliant because he understands that uh, there, there isn't a, a radical divide in the world of psychology and the world of spirituality. There's a quality of will and we project this onto leaders and then we invest them with strength, which perhaps they don't really have. And then we believe we get support if we follow them. This fragile me can also be shored up by looking outwardly for appreciation and validation in what psychoanalysts call the mirroring transference. So we create these images of ourself. And we often project these images, these idols onto a leader. Calvin, who was a, a Protestant reformer, I don't know when it was in the 17th century or something, said the heart is a perpetual idol factory. The heart creates all these images. Anyway, I often find clients are touched by something, but they resist feeling how moved they are because they fear losing control. If we allow ourselves to lose control and cry, for example, we fall out of our minds and experience the crying directly as a powerful release, a wave that can take us down into becoming one with the ocean. It takes honesty and courage to really allow our disappointment because it can feel as if we're literally dying to the entitled hopes we've been identified with. But if we can do this, our hearts begin to recover and expand and re recover their capacity to love again. Trungpa Rinpoche says that disappointment is the chariot of the Dharma. So if we stay with disappointment, we can feel the sweetness on our own heart directly and immediately. This is very different from knowing yourself through the objectifying lens of the mind. As I work with clients, I find they have a vestigial awareness of this kind of love, but rarely allow themselves to feel it fully and directly. One of my clients told me he felt rosy towards his son, and it took a few questions to help him really land in the depth of his love and turn to appreciation. Inquiry, in the Alma sense, its job is to open up the space so that you feel more and more deeply into what is true for you. So this is a revolutionary way to begin to unpeel true nature using basic knowing. I have found as a client in the world of psychotherapy that the only thing that seemed to heal me are moments of grace that softened up and infused my ego structure. To give an example, I had a client who took her needs prisoner as an adult who would only eat once a day. However, she had a wonderful marriage with a man she loved dearly, who loved her deeply and Unfortunately, he died at the end of a long and painful illness. As we inquired, and she began to allow her sadness, which was challenging for her, obviously. But as she felt her sadness, um, she could begin to surrender the layers of defense, the pride, whatever it was that got in the way, and feel the lack and longing in her own heart. But as she did this, um, she began to know, she began to feel the love that she'd projected onto him in her own heart. She could feel the sweetness and tenderness directly. So anyway, I'm going to stop talking very soon. So I'm going to invite you to pair up and uh, you're going to have five minutes each. And there's an opportunity, um, if you want to take the opportunity, to tell the other person perhaps about a, an important moment in your life. And as you share this moment, see if you can tune into the feelings, say with the sensations in the body, 
see to what extent you can uh, begin to know it directly and immediately. And the person you're sharing it with, it's very important that you, um, you, you don't have to say anything. You just need to listen and don't in any way be critical or judgmental because obviously I'm inviting you all to take a risk to perhaps open up your hearts about something that might make you feel vulnerable. So I hope you will all, uh, um, you know, take this in good faith. So um, I've done this before with someone with a group in India. Uh, one of the women uh, was talking about her anxiety before giving birth to her son. I think it was her son. And then when she saw the baby, I don't know, something just happened. She just felt this confidence and the rightness of it all. And it, it, it certainly moved me. So just see what happens. Just explore. Um, it, 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 the point is for you to begin to dare to trust the truth of your experience, whatever that means to you. Um, and uh, you, you can feel free to, you might want, might want to share it with me. You might want to ask me questions. Um, please feel free once we've done the exercise. Okay, so um, over to you. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, because I, it's not related to this session uh, that we had just now, but there was a question I had uh, about, because the theme was you know, around consciousness. Uh, so in Zen, uh, is there something like the consciousness uh, which has no uh, perturbations or the, uh, you know, that like in yoga and so on, they talk about the chitta and its uh, modifications, which gives rise to, uh, you know, the duality and vicissitudes of experience. Um, is there something in the Dharma and in Zen, which talks about similarly, like, you know, an unmodified consciousness uh, that you've come across or, you know, consciousness that is, neutral and is that the basis of uh, a non-suffering experience mm. well buddhism traditionally talks about um um you know the, the mind is disturbed by greed and ignorance and anger and um suzuki roshi uh, his english wasn't Suzuki Roshi was a Japanese priest based in San Francisco a long time ago. His English wasn't very good, but just because of that, it was often graphic. He, he talked about a gaining idea. Very often we're looking through the lens of something we want. And uh, actually, we often feel a lack inside of ourselves. We're often running away from what feels like some deficiency or lack. And then we believe we want to fill it up with something from the outside. Uh, may, maybe many lives are structured by this. Um, so um, th that's how Zen sort of see, sees, Zen is just a school of Buddhism. That's how Buddhism sees the disturbance that uh, we're, 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 well, we're in a way a bit like children. We're, we're looking for the good things, but we don't realize they're in our own heart. I, I don't know, does this begin to answer your question? Or? Yeah, yeah, I think it does, yes. So there is something similar about you know, state which is not disturbed and which is not, uh, in some sense, colored by these afflictions. Yes, it can be as simple as, uh, well, uh, mindfulness. It, it, you know, I, I quoted this little boy who very nearly murdered someone, but um, when when clients ask me about internal family systems therapy, I often talk about him because, it, it, well, it seems odd to say, but he had a sort of sort of purity and an innocence, really, as, as an eight year old, and he could recognise this this anger, quite extreme anger, and he had been blended with and identified with the anger, and well, it's just possibly he could have killed someone, so mindfulness is being able to recognize what's going on and somehow or other he was able to recognize the the anger and not be identified with it and then there's some sort of clear seeing and then he could also see which buddhists probably wouldn't talk about how the anger was actually motivated by trying to protect a very frightened part of him so somehow or other he was able to step back into some sort of clear seeing um i have this all happened 20 years ago and i happen to know 
uh, from his mother that well, he's now grown up and nothing, nothing like that ever happened again. And um, so I didn't, I, well, you know, that, that's what mindfulness is, that we have this precious resource of being able to witness our experience. And the more accurately you can, like for me, um, this dream I had of a ghost and an elephant, um, <laughs> it's taken me years to begin to unpack these, these things um, because they get wrapped up in often quite young perceptions, the perceptions of a young child. And, and um, it, 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 they can be buried under all layers of defenses. But uh, nonetheless, for me, uh, the, traditionally in Buddhism, um, anger would not be seen as a good thing. They would just expect you to get rid of it or to uh, perhaps dwell on loving kindness. But for me, um, and I think many people actually have to do this, if you sense into the anger directly and you begin to re relinquish some of the stories which the anger is attached to, uh, I was very afraid of my anger. I had a violent father. Uh, so I, I suppose I was very frightened of it. I had to, at times, stay with the fear, face the fear, and experience the anger directly. When you really feel the anger directly, it's like a heat and power. and it, it's like you it gives you the strength to stand yeah. on your own feet and to it gives you courage and discrimination. So this is why Al Almas is wonderful. He gives you the the inspiration and a map to begin to journey through some of these waves in consciousness to 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 recover this this clarity, this strength. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Guys in the chat. Uh, the implicit memory related trauma is difficult to deal with. Do you want to say any more about that? I mean, it, it, it's true. It's, it's uh, uh, it, it, trauma can be very, I, I suppose it's another reason I'm talking about these, these things that um, uh, I had a violent father um, so I suppose I, I was traumatized and, and I was very afraid of my anger. And um, I had lots of Buddhists tell me that I should just imagine loving kindness, but that didn't really work for me. It might work for some someone else who perhaps wasn't as frightened as I was, or maybe who's holier than me. But um, for me, it, it's been revolutionary to sort of dive into the ocean of my experience and begin to, um, it's a bit like finding a pearl, you know, like, it makes me think of oysters, you know, like oysters, oysters get a grain of sand in them. And basically they, they produce oyster snot because it drives them mad, but the oyster snot becomes a pearl. And it's possible to dive into the irritation of your experience and it's possible Obviously, it's not easy to stay with, say, irritation or resentment or anger. And yet, um, anger is such a powerful force that if you learn to trust it, and it's about feeling it in the body directly. Thinking about it in the mind just doesn't help at all. And there are many other qualities, like um, for Almas, it's also been very useful for me to sense into the belly. I mean, I'm just going to... <laughs> Anyway, but it, it, if you feel like it, put one hand on your belly, below the belly button for a moment, and take a deep breath. And see, it's always useful to recognize what your mind is on about, to recognize where your focus of attention is in this moment, and then to switch the focus of attention, in this case, onto the belly. And just see if you can take a deep breath. And as you breathe in, sense, not think, sense into the experience of your breath pushing your belly up against your hand. Um, the Japanese, uh, you know, the samurai used to train to bring their attention down to this area. They call it the hara. The Chinese in acupuncture call it the tan. I can't think of what the pronunciation is at this moment, but it's something I know about, and the Sufis know about it. And this is the center of the will. The will is not something remotely understood in the world of therapy. Oh, there are very, very few writers on it, Asagi, early Rollo May, whatever. But it can be very valuable to begin to, um, you can begin to discover true support, especially with trauma, 
but we felt overwhelmed and often overwhelmed by someone who seemed to have much more power than us, it can be very valuable to begin to get some stability, some groundedness by bringing this, your attention down into the belly center. So anyway, I just want to um, say can, these things can be very, very valuable. So um, we're coming to an end anyway, aren't we, really? Is any any last questions, thoughts? I, I went to India first in 1971 when the population was half what it is now and uh, it had quite a profound impact on me. And... <laughs> it was shocking. I, I, well, if I'm honest, it was shocking partly. You know, it was shocking seeing... Um, I remember seeing a beggar with enormous testicles uh, on a little platform, you know, with wheels on. And, because in the West, you don't see things like that. You don't see people, you know, like in Varanasi, you don't see people being burnt, their corpses being burnt. And India, in a way, has some very great religious traditions. And I, I, I really sincerely hope that you, you will you might read Nisargadatta or Amna Maharshi or some other teachers, because you have some pearls in your own tradition. And um, I've spent 50 years um, trying to figure me out. And I, I studied anthropology in 1968, which in many ways I was very, very privileged to study it, but it's almost completely useless, really. And I've studied a lot of psychotherapy and a great deal of it it's, it's exactly the experience of trying to find out what an elephant is. And they say, oh, well, it's like, it's like a leaf. And uh, it's not that they're all completely wrong. There's some, there's some useful things that say Melanie Klein says or Carl Rogers says, but they haven't gone deep enough. And I, I sincerely hope, I assume some of you are psychologists or social workers or psychiatrists or something. And I sincerely hope that you don't just study Western science because, um, Maybe it's maybe Western science is useful if you want to get a man on the moon, and maybe it's useful if you want to build a bridge, but it's almost completely useless if you want to understand what a human being is. And over this last 70 years or so since I was born, well, we've done terrible things to the planet out of greed and heedlessness. And my country is in a sort of collective nervous breakdown and I think it's fair to say America is also in a kind of collective nervous breakdown. And we desperately need some people who are interested enough or driven enough to begin to dig deep and find this pure mind that you are. So anyway, that's, that's what I want to say. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk. Thank you, Bruce. If yeah. I would just share... Uh... A first and symbol that's coming to me almost like through the session. Um, and it's, it's interesting how you close because throughout the session, my sense is, you know, um, sitting beside a banyan tree, listening uh, to, to some really deep wisdom. <laughs> You know, that's the, that's the image that's in my mind. And, I, and for me, um, I'd be really grateful to, to be able to explore this concept, uh, you know, in, in receiving that through the generosity of your own experiential sharing, of your own life sharing. Uh, something about receiving this concept, the subject, widely talked about, as you pointed out, very rarely understood through your life journey. Um, something about that uh, brought a lot of sense of something very compactful about it to be able to just receive that, I mean, you know, just, just that itself, just the receiving itself. And, um, and, and also, you know, then being almost feeling like having the privilege of receiving that along with the wisdom of so many that you have shared, that pointed out, 
uh, through your learning, your journey, your interaction, and, and that you've also, you know, uh, a glimpse of it made available to us in the readings that you've provided. So really, thank you so much, Bruce, for, for having the, had life that you've had so that we can receive this in this <laughs> moment. Oh, thank you. Mm. I should point out my, my my monk's name means dull, blunt, and simple. I, I think it was. Uh, I think they hoped I would become simple. <laughs> um, so anyway, thank you very much. I, it really was an honour to give this talk, and it, it helped me uh, clarify uh, some of my thoughts. So it was it was good for me. <laughs>